Ladies and gentlemen, Minecraft 1.18 has been out for a while now and as such this video is a fair bit late. My apologies for that, the period leading up to the release was quite crazy and I needed a bit of time off. Anyway, better late than never, my name is Sly Slime and I am finally here to give you a guide to all the technical changes in Minecraft 1.18. If you're looking for the gameplay changes, I have a fantastic video about those two linked right here. Before we dive in, let me note that there's one exception. Changes to the experimental formats for custom worlds will not be included here. Look forwards to a separate video about that. Anyway, let's start out with the pack formats. The version of both data packs and resource packs have been updated and are now 8. In use for commands, the length limit for scoreboard objective names, score holders and team names has been removed. A number of bugs with world borders have been fixed and the world border size is now synchronized between dimensions, with the coordinate scaling of the nether applied properly. The center position specified in the world border command now also has a limit. Moving on to data, spawners now support a custom spawn rules field in the spawn data and in spawn potentials entries. It may contain fields block light limit and skylight limit both integer ranges with min-inclusive and max-inclusive fields. To make the spawn potentials format similar to other weighted lists, the structure was also changed so the height, entity type and the data now reside in separate fields. To accommodate that change, the previous content of spawn data has been moved to spawndata.entity, which makes the format of that field the same as elements of spawn potentials.data. In other data news, since a number of biomes were renamed in the update, their IDs have also been renamed, so any references to those biomes need to be updated. Let's move on to advancements and let's begin with new triggers. There's a fall from height trigger that triggers when a player lands after falling. Possible conditions include a player condition matched against the player who fell, a start position location predicate matching the position before the fall began, and a distance predicate for the distance between start position and the player's position at the end of the fall. Another new trigger is Ride Entity in Lava. It triggers every tick when the player rides an entity in lava. Available conditions for this one are exactly the same as for Fall from Height with the difference that start position matches the position where the ride started, which is to say, the position the first tick the entity was on lava. The nether travel trigger has also changed, with the entered condition renamed to start position to match the new triggers, and the exited condition entirely removed, since the same effect can be had by matching on the player's location. Let's talk about loot tables. The functions setContents and setLootTable now require a new field called type, with a correct block entity type matching what the loot table is applied to. This helps make sure the data can be correctly upgraded between different versions of the game. There's also a new function called setPotion, which is used to set the potion type on anything that has potion data, like a potion, splash potion or tipped arrow. It takes one parameter called ID, which is the potion ID to set. In the vanilla data, this is now used everywhere instead of the set tag function. We've got plenty of things to still cover like particle news, fonts, tags and resource packs, but before we move on to that, let me take a moment to ask you to please light up that like button. That gets YouTube to show the video to more viewers, so I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Let's keep on trucking with particle news. The light and barrier particles have been removed. Instead, there is now a block marker particle. It shows a billboard with the texture defined as the particle texture slot for the model assigned to the configured block state. The syntax for summoning this particle is the same as for block particles. In font news, there's a new font included with the game. It's called Illager Alt and is the rune-like font from Minecraft Dungeons. You can use this from commands that show text components like Telraw and Title. Let's talk about tags. There are a fair few new ones in this version. Let's start with block tags. There are new block tags for Big Drip Leaf Placeable, Azalea Grows On, and Azalea Roots Replaceable that pretty much controls what their names indicate. There are also grouping tags for Replaceable Plants and Terracotta. In addition, a number of new block tags that control spawning have been added with tags for animals, axolotls, foxes, goats, mushrooms, parrots, rabbits and wolves. As well as a special tag for the variant of polar bear spawning that happens in frozen oceans. A block tag has also been renamed. 
Lava Pool Stone Replaceable is now called Lava Pool Stone Cannot Replace, which is a more accurate description of its function. There are also two new item tags in this version, collection tags for Dirt and Terracotta, both mirroring the contents of the block tags with the same names. In resource pack news, there's a new sprite in the inventory.png user interface file for the thin layout version of the effects list in the inventory. Light blocks now have a separate model per block state instead of a single model. There's a new music disc item for the other side music disc, and the texture mapping has changed for lily pads, potted cacti, and the tops and bottoms of doors. There's also a new text file, postcredits.txt, containing the poem text that gets displayed at the end of the credits screen. Should anyone sit around for the approximately 14 years it takes for that to scroll to the end. In performance news, there's a new startup option called JFR Profile, and a new command, JFR, to start profiling with the Java Flight Recorder. The game also records a few custom JFR events to help diagnose performance problems. There's a new property for how the game handles background thread count. The max thread limit now defaults to 255, which means the game will attempt to use a thread count matching the logical core count of the system up to 255. To change this limit, set the max.bg.threads java system property. I'll also mention that there are some significant changes to the storage format for chunks. The details are probably best checked in the changelog or on the Minecraft wiki. For modding, I'll just note that the game now builds and runs using Java 17. Let's wrap up with some server news. Servers can now set a new property called Hide Online Players, which makes the server not respond with a list of players online for ping requests. The size limit for resource packs downloaded from a server has been bumped up from 100 megabytes to 250 megabytes. And finally, the server.jar file now bundles individual libraries instead of merging all the files, which means the libraries are now extracted on first startup. The resulting folder structure matches that used by the client game. This also changes how you run a different main class from the default, which now uses the bundler main class property. I'll leave an example command line for how to run the data generator in the video description. And that's it for the tech changes in Minecraft 1.18. I'd once again like to apologize for this video being late and thank you for the patience. And also, thank you for sticking around to the end of the video, I really appreciate it. If you're interested in even more changes, there were significant tech changes in Minecraft 1.18.2 as well, so check out this video right here to find out more about those.